Hello and welcome to I Could Murder a Podcast. And I'm joined by, yep, the overtly obtuse, the obscenely odorous, the oblivious Ben Carter. Yeah, that's pretty good. I have been, I, I, in my Lever book for leaving secondary school, you have a little goodbye, you used to sign the shirt, goodbye mm. book. Heavily scented, I got called, but in a positive way, like lots of. Smell you later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I'll take it. Overly odorous, that's, um, yeah. I could go straight on the CV. Um, but how are we doing, boys? Great to be back with another episode. Producer Dan, you all right? Yeah, very good. Tom, yeah. if you if you could give me one D word for me, what would you what would you do? Oh. Off the top of your head. I was thinking dank straight away. Dank. Okay, yeah, dank Dan. Dank Dan's quite good. I'll take that, yeah. Fine. Um just one, just one yeah, Okay, cool for you. <laughs> it's P next week, I've just clocked. Ooh. Oh, that's geez. gonna be a good one. Yeah. I don't know what I'm gonna do. I get through the alphabet and I have to go on to numbers i don't know even how that would work <laughs> but yes thank you for joining us yes it is a new case this week it is a case that has been uh requested a long time i think over the over the years we've been doing this podcast a lot of people have requested this case it is has one that's been covered by a lot of podcasts but it's one that keeps driving conversation definitely i i don't know about you guys but it's always been one for me that i've always been aware of but i've never really kind of looked into i've always kind of thought feel a bit non plus Yes, Jim can't Jim can't swim. Uh, one a, a, a channel we already love is one that I remember seeing from that early on. But after that, I didn't really kind of go any further in. So yeah, it, it's one that I'm excited to go through it with you guys and get your opinions as well as you know afterwards hearing the opinions of the audience. Sorry, but before we before we begin, I wanted to say a huge congratulations to Sophiella the Scorpion Lambert for uh, for winning her bout. Uh, Dan's lovely wife was in a, in a white collar boxing event and she kicked ass. She dominated. Um, so proud of her. I mean, the the level of boxing throughout the whole night was actually incredible. It got better and better, but I was getting drunker and drunker. But um, <laughs> I mean, it's only eight pound a pint, so that was fine. Um, cheapest chips. Yeah, cheapest chips. <laughs> but um, cheapest pizza that was twenty good. Yes, it, it was great to see. And I just want to say a huge congratulations to her for kicking some ass. Good safe. Well done, safe. And this week's case, of course, it is Casey Anthony. Um, we are going to probably fall into saying Anthony regularly without throughout this because that is the UK way of saying it. So don't uh, don't have don't get too angry if we do. So Casey Anthony, America's most hated mum, the murder of Kaylee Anthony, the mother from hell, the case of Casey and Kaylee Anthony, America's most divisive mother, Casey Anthony, the baby killer question mark is what we've gone for for our particular video. But Ben's clue. Um, do you want to dissect that for us, Ben? Yeah, it won't take long. Someone got it within a few hours last week. It wasn't as um, uh, divisive as the North Sentinel Island one. It was, I wonder what Hannibal Lecter puts all his books in. Bookcase, Casey C and uh, Anthony Hopkins. Casey Anthony. Um, But it got decoded very, very quickly. And uh, yeah, congratulations, Jolene, um, for, yeah, Instagram. Got it straight away. A lot of other guesses, which surprised me. but uh, yeah, a fascinating so, case. So just to confirm, was was the dinner the, was the dinner one the previous app or was it this app? It was the previous app. I don't know if we rolled it over, but maybe we could, you know, hit us up, Jolene, and we'll send you a Just Eat voucher. <laughs> well, we'll go with next week. Next week will be a rollover. So um, £100, any restaurant you want to go to, Ben can go or he doesn't <laughs> have to go. It's up to you. I would say, and I'm, and I'm pedantic, I'm trying to not be as pedantic, but book, put things in a bookcase rather than a bookshelf. The bookcase a thing? Am I being book silly? Case. Yeah. Bookcase, yeah. Bookcase, what is a bookcase? Yeah. It's like a big... It's a big shelf, but... Oh. A big cabinet for books without a doors. Like a bookshelf. The secret door is behind the bookcase. Yeah, okay, yeah. You yeah, sounded yeah, yeah. like him. Anthony. Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Brilliant. <laughs> But yeah, this is a little, another little peek behind the curtain as well. This case was actually a last minute swap. Um, we were actually going to do a, a, a very different case that we felt was slightly too similar to two cases we covered earlier in the series. Um, so yeah, this came in at last minute. I think that'll make people fairly happy because it is a case. Although I mentioned I've seen some content about this case before and I was a bit kind of, eh, it, I, it's understandably incredibly upsetting and I understand the passion and obsession uh, revolving this case. And it's one I'm very... Uh, interested in uh, going through with you boys and like i always say dan you two you very familiar on this one no i am familiar uh, but simply because of uh good old jim can't swim yeah i'm the same as you it's one that i've listened to um whilst researching it the first initial things i listened to i don't think i've been as frustrated and ang- feeling like i could ask better questions than she's been asked okay. and and i'll 
hold her to account a bit more on some of the things that she's saying. We'll get into it. I watched a more recent documentary, which actually has her in it being interviewed. And it's just confused me a bit, but we'll, we'll get into it. It is... Mm. It's very, very, very peculiar, this case. And I think it will find, this will cause a lot of people when they're hearing what she's saying and quotes from her and, you know, some tapes from her, they'll be like, what is she doing? Why is she saying that? It's just incredibly, yeah, it's odd. It's very odd. It's made, maybe made me think it's not as clean cut as a lot of people think. Okay. But as I said, a lot of people will find this case incredibly it causes a lot of anger and they're very strong opinions on it um but i'm not one to show away from I, it. I think i'm about the 90 percent mark in uh in terms of i i feel the consistent theme that she was involved in some way but that's obviously not 100 percent. it's not beyond a reasonable doubt um and there are a couple of elements in this case towards the end that do confuse me as well um for it to be as cut and dry but um, I'm sure, as, as Tom said, there are there are obviously a lot of people, uh, thousands of people that are um, very passionate uh, about Casey's guilt. And I can completely understand why, as, as we'll go on to discuss. But yeah, very interesting episode, very um, controversial episode and one that we've we've kind of condensed because other other podcasts have done sort of five, six, seven parters. We've condensed it all into one big one. Um, and yeah, I'm excited as well uh, to see what producer Dan thinks come the end of this. I'm talking about producers, Dan. Could, could, you, um, could you please set the scene a bit, Dan? <laughs> of course I can. The Casey Anthony case sent shockwaves across America in 2008 as a young mother stood trial for the murder of her two-year-old daughter, Kaylee. What began as a report of a missing child quickly spiralled into a high-stakes legal battle filled with twists, turns and courtroom drama. As the evidence unfolded, the public was captivated by the mystery and misinformation surrounding Kaylee's disappearance and Casey's role in the tragedy. With intense media scrutiny and passionate debates raging, the trial culminated in a stunning verdict that left many shocked and divided. The Casey Anthony case remains one of the most sensational and controversial trials in recent memory, with Anthony being labelled as a modern-day O.J. Simpson, challenging perceptions of legal justice and raising profound questions about the nature of truth and accountability. An interesting thing is after, as we go into it, in the aftermath, uh, Casey actually aligns herself a little bit with O.J. Simpson herself in terms of how she feels she's been treated, which I've heard in other podcasts I'm saying, maybe not the best person to align yourself with, mm-hmm. someone that a lot of people believe to be guilty. A truly baffling case. Anyone who doesn't know about this case, you're going to go on a bit of a journey with this case for sure. And I'm very interested and excited to hear what you guys think about it. Yeah, definitely align yourself with someone that's been a 100% vindicated mm. and proven of their innocence not with any air of suspicion around them that so you get there you go like, i feel like people are treating me like rolf harris and i said what do you mean you go they just think i'm good at art and i was like oh, what are you doing then uh the what, what were they two things just <laughs> oh god yeah rolf yeah i don't know why they keep comparing me to him oh it's the bit it's the little beard <laughs> quote i believe we need a uh, <laughs> <laughs> but before we continue a quick word from our sponsors <laughs> It's Wine52! So we are super happy to have the team at Wine52 back on board, helping us out here over at I Could Murder a Podcast. And this month, it's Italian month, a taste of the best of Italy. Arriva Dirty Wine! I'm a bloody wine fiend, and if you're a wine fiend or you just like a tipple of wine... Make more noise. That's not put it off burn, is it? Fuck me. Sorry, I was getting the snacks. <laughs> Arriva Dirty Wine. I bloody love wine. I'm a wine fiend. But if you're a wine fiend or just just like a tipple of wine, why not go to Wine52 and use our code? You get a free case of wine, which is three bottles, and it comes with snacks. It comes with a lovely little booklet that tells you all about the wine. All you have to do is cover the postage. Head over to wine52.com forward slash ICMAP. So the beautiful thing about Wine52 is that you can opt in for a mixed box, or if you if you like me and you like the white wine, go straight for the white. So let's give it a little whirl. And not only is it a very cool bottle that you could perhaps put a candle in afterwards, but the tastes are amazing. Um, Getting a real symphony of vanilla and peach. Oh, it's on the tongue. And it's not literally just wine in a box. As Tom said, you do get snacks. And this month, you've got pizzeria bites and Italian biscuit bites. Oh, wonderful. Can I have another? And why not be more like me and join the wine club and get a case every month? And it's not for you, that's absolutely fine. You can pause and cancel at any time. Yeah, it really blows someone away. If you've got a party, a barbecue, there's loads of them coming up, then uh, you're going to look like a right hipster. Yeah, that springtime barbecues. But... 
So you've got your wine, you've got your snacks, why not pair it with Glug Magazine, which takes you on a journey about the particular wine and snacks that you're tasting. Um, filled to the brim with goodness. Just like the wine. So remember, that's wine52.com forward slash ICMAP to claim that free case of wine. And trust me, you won't regret it. These wines are delicious and also you are helping support the podcast. Wine52.com forward slash ICMAP. Cheers. So as always, a quote to start us off. And this one comes from Casey Anthony herself. uh, And there will be plenty more from Casey throughout the episode. People lie to the cops every day. Cops lie to people every day. I'm just one of the unfortunate idiots who admitted that they lied. My dad was a cop. You can read into that what you want to. But I don't give a shit about what anyone thinks about me. And I never will. I sleep pretty good at night. I didn't kill my daughter. But I'm ashamed of the person that I was immediately get the very defensive vibe and obviously that's gonna be a huge thing we're gonna get throughout this case she's quite blunt with how she says things as well which i think don't garner a lot of sympathy from a lot of people um but yes we'll, we'll obviously dissect that but yes we're gonna jump into the background of casey and kaylee anthony as well as the wider anthony family before moving into the key timeline of events and aftermath casey marie anthony was born on the 19th of march 1986 in the city of warren ohio which um, ben like it's her birthday today 38th birthday of the day we're recording, which is a bit spooky. So she'd say born the same year as you and we're doing it the same. No, way. no, I was, I'm a, I'm a young gun compared to her. Oh. Yeah, young and 37. No, no, not even close. Not even really close, actually. August oh. birthday as well. As well. <laughs> it's the oldest in my year, yeah. Oldest in your year? Uh, wait, yeah. hang on. No, youngest in my year, sorry. Youngest, yeah, because the cut-off point was, yeah. You held back, though, for a couple of years. So you... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm misremembering it again. Um, yeah, but yeah, so. we're very spooky. Her, her birthday is uh, today while we're recording. Mm. Do a little custom shout-out message on, for man. her. Yeah, I, I have nothing to say about your birthday. <laughs> oh, that brilliant. Shots fired like there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> shots fired. So Casey was the second of two children born to Cindy and George Anthony, having an older brother called Lee. Uh, There was a a four year gap between the two. Uh, And a little very quick one uh, for you. Uh, The city of Warren was actually the birthplace of rock star Dave Grohl, um, which I thought Dan might like. I've got another confession to make. I'm no fool. And the uh, the nickname for the city is actually Festival City uh, as well, uh, with the city's motto being celebrate our history and create our future and turn it up to fucking 11. <laughs> um, the last part was not in there. Uh, um, yeah, I was going to say that's quite a nerdy one. And then, yeah. yeah, yeah. But, um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, celebrate our history and create our future. The Anthony family spent the first three years of Casey's life living in Warren before later trading the Buckeye State for the Sunshine State as they relocated to Orlando, Florida. Casey's parents met in quite an unconventional way. Um, George, although in a state of separation at the time, was still married to his first wife when his sister was suddenly taken ill. Uh, Now, Cindy just happened to be the nurse looking after his sister when George arrived at the hospital for a visit. Uh, yeah, it's quite. It's a, if he wasn't in the well, it's, it's still kind of a meet cute. He could be walking into the hospital with a, a, a bouquet of flowers ready for his sister. She comes out the door, they bump into each other. They're not for me, the are they? No, it's my sister, she's very ill. Oh, do you want to buy me a coffee then? I'm not particularly going to see my sister. All right, here's my number anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's basically what happened. Um, yeah. With the addition that the pair very quickly struck up a bond and entered a relationship together, with Cindy in the full knowledge of George being still legally married to another woman. As Cindy, and this is a pattern with George and Cindy that will flow throughout this case, as she wanted to outwardly appear to have met the man of her dreams and have the perfect new relationship, she actually hid the news from all of her family and friends that George uh, was married to another woman. And George eventually went on to finalise his divorce from his first wife before later marrying Cindy with his now ex-wife stating that George was a compulsive liar and a compulsive gambler. In other instances, George's first wife claimed that she had suffered a miscarriage, and when she went to inform George of this news, he secretly filed for divorce. No, that's not very cute. Um, And apparently, she had to find out from a third party, uh, and we're sharing this with you, this is relevant, because it will link to some of George's and his future daughter's later behaviours when it comes to avoiding any kind of conflict. How do you secretly file for divorce? Not that I... So basically, well, I think they hadn't discussed the idea of divorce whatsoever, and then all of a sudden some papers sort of turn up on a desk. Oh, honey, it's for you. (laughs) 
I'm just off to the hospital with some chocolates. <laughs> Isn't your sister nil by mouth? Oh. Um, yeah, interesting. In Ohio, George was working as a sheriff's deputy. He loved the role, he loved the uniform, he loved the car, while Cindy was working as a nurse. But after Lee was born and Cindy fell pregnant with Casey, Cindy had aspirations to become a stay-at-home mum. She convinced George to get a role at his father's car dealership, Anthony Autocar, as she viewed this as a way to earn massive commission. However, he never really took to the role and didn't enjoy the sales aspect, with this culminating in a very public, heated argument with his father, resulting in George pushing his dad through a plate glass window, hospitalizing him. After this, George was, of course, fired. Yeah, not a good, not a good thing to do with your boss, especially if it's your dad, pushing him through a window. I wonder if it was the same hospital as his yeah. sister. But yeah, shortly after the incident, shockingly, George tried to start up his own car dealership, even though he didn't like it. I feel like a very spiteful thing to do. Aptly named George Anthony Auto Car. Despite George remortgaging the house to fund this, this business failed almost immediately. Stalled. Uh, with George and Cindy later having to declare bankruptcy, Cindy found this whole ordeal absolutely horrifying, not knowing the realities of their financial situation, which George hid from her until he had no other choice but to tell her. Not painting George in a great, great light here. No, for some balance, because we will do the same with Casey. So they moved to Florida in order to get a fresh start. Growing up in a middle-class household in Florida, Casey was described as intelligent, outgoing, and popular amongst her friends and family, and these are the three words that Casey would strive to be perceived as throughout her life. She attended schools in the Orlando area, where she was known for her animated personality and her involvement in extracurricular activities. Whatever she was doing or wherever she was going, Casey was known as the girl who always had a smile on her face. And those with a keen eye will see that our thumbnail this week, she's got quite the smile, but it's in a courtroom. So, uh, again, another thing that people got under their skin. A lot of people would describe Casey in a friendship group, describe her as being the mum of the group, which uh, is interesting. And also say, yeah, she's always fun loving. She wasn't the most popular, but she was fine and content and, and she was happy with where she was within the social spectrum. However, Casey's childhood was not without its challenges, and these would become more complicated as she grew older. She reportedly experienced lots of conflict within her family, including her parents' tumultuous relationship and her father's history of legal troubles. Um, yeah, we've already discussed a couple of them there. And as will become an extremely vivid element of this week's episode, when she entered her high school years, Casey started to become known as someone that would lie a lot, and regular patterns of mistruths began to occur which would also become a running theme later in life. Casey's parents apparently had vastly different personalities and neither of them were afraid of letting the other one know about it when it came to the pair having arguments. Um, and yeah, they would, they would regularly argue whether it was in front of their children or not. Though these arguments would never really extend beyond more than a few hours and never actually become physical, they would often be quite blunt and abrasive to one another to the point that George would often leave the family home. And according to one family friend... I've watched Cindy berate George over the littlest thing. Just nasty, mean stuff. She'll say, George, you're so stupid, you're an idiot, in front of his friends and children. But she never wanted to divorce him for fear of losing the house. Cindy is very type A, and she really runs that house. She is the one that earns the money. George sort of defers to her, does whatever she wants, and goes back to treating her like royalty. Despite what this family friend said, Cindy had an excellent reputation in the local community and at her place of work. With her medical background, she was quickly able to get work as a registered nurse at a local orthopaedic surgeon. Um, and so, yeah, she, I think she had a few months out of work before the move to Orlando, but was very quick, obviously, with the financial situation that the family were in. She was very quick to be able to pick up a new role. She was well respected by her colleagues. And despite their occasional arguments, George was extremely fond of her but he found his career prospects more limited and seemed to hover between roles. As we'll go on to explore in our timeline, Casey made numerous accusatory claims about her upbringing and her relationships with her parents. Casey's father, George, will go on to play a central role in this case and their relationship will come under a lot of scrutiny. So there are some articles online that stated that George actually worked as a homicide detective for Rumble County Sheriff's Department for more than 10 years prior to the move to Florida. Um, but it's it's quite hard to verify exactly where he where he did work or what role he exactly held. But it can be confirmed he definitely did work briefly as a police officer before then trying to go into business with his father, which did not end well. Before then trying to start up a very similar business by himself, which did not end well. Before ultimately looking down an alternate and slightly more traditional career prospect. After moving to Orlando, George started working as a security guard and would regularly work long shifts, including overtime and night shifts, away from the family home. 
Casey claims that the reason for her father working so many hours per week was, number one, due to the fact that George wanted to be away from the rest of the family for extended periods of time, but number two, due to the fact that he had lost more than $30,000 of their family savings as a result of an internet scam. Um, I think he actually, it was something to do like with a Nigerian prince, and it was genuinely, uh, it was something as cliche as that. I just can't imagine an email and we get one going, these guys really need some help. And they're going to be very thankful and give me extra money if I do it. <laughs> yeah, different time. This was essentially an anonymous email scam that promised a $2.2 million return on investment from a bank account based in the UK. And ashamed by his actions and not afraid to lie, George apparently informed his wife that he developed quite a significant online gambling addiction. That's better to do it. I wasn't hoodwinked. I've just got a gambling addiction. Um, yeah. And she said, oh, that's fine, honey. If it, as long as you're not getting hoodwinked. And that was the real reason that the money was lost. That's very peculiar. Yeah. I think the gambling, yeah, definitely the gambling addiction rather than just a thinking an investment went wrong. It's more sympathetic. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, but yeah, it's not great to have done that with your family savings. Um, Of course, no. no. He's an interesting character, George. And reading into him a bit more, a lot of people that are, you know, uh, fascinated with this case find him quite creepy and quite unnerving whereas other people are very sympathetic towards him he later has a bit of a pencil attached doesn't he which doesn't help his case yes. i mean that's yes. rich coming from me having a tash for about five seasons that we've done <laughs> but um is more pencily thank you before the comments come in here's more pencily george as well as his wife cindy in not wanting anybody to assume anything other than the pair having a picture perfect family would lie about this incident anytime that the family's finances or george's work habits were questioned by friends or relatives to be fair, I think it's quite an easy thing to keep under wraps, isn't it? In terms of like, we've lost 30 grand. You're not going to be a thing you chat about your family's irregular again. So, no, seriously, George, where is that 30 grand? So, Unless they revealed a little bit and then had to, oh, no, no. Like, they made like a passive comment about, you know. George, you need some more drinks, please. And the 30 grand you lost. What? No, nothing. <laughs> this might potentially be where Casey was first exposed to the notion of telling lies. She would become an expert on the topic. So yeah, she kind of has a few different theories as to why she learned to lie so well. But yeah, George was definitely an influence on her. And it could be fair to say that lying almost became a default option to the Anthony family whenever they encountered any difficult situation. Casey also alleged, among numerous other things that we'll discuss uh, later in the episode, that her father was regularly unfaithful towards Cindy, but that the pair was so against the idea of divorce due to how it may look to outsiders and also the impact it may have on their children. So they're very about appearances from all that I've been able to gather here um, in the early part of Casey's life. Very like, much like right. Hyacinth Bucket. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, very keen on having that picture perfect lifestyle portrayed to the outside. So instead of any time considering divorce or even a um, secret divorce, um, they decided to stick together and try to make things work, once again lying about matters. The pair remained together with the exception of a six to eight month brief separation due to the financial scam issue and George also losing his well-paid job in 2005. Uh, Both George and Cindy would remain adamant that their relationship was a happy and healthy one. And shockingly, although I just joked about it, um, during this particular argument after the scam and uh, George also losing his his job, George once again secretly filed for divorce. But based on what each of them were likely to lose from the divorce, the couple were quickly able to reconcile. Seems a really happy marriage, doesn't it? Let's let's stay together because we'll lose loads of money and I might lose the house. But I'm going to leave you if you lose a job (laughs) because I'm with you for the... Yeah, it doesn't sound... Yeah, very... uh, A family built on a nice foundation of love. Yes, yeah. Um, Because when you're introduced to this case and it just starts with Casey um, in some of the documentaries, it's really hard to see how she is the way she is. But Mm. from from this, you can kind of see where she may have got it from. As Casey entered adolescence, her behavior began to raise concerns among those close to her. More and more patterns of lying were caught out by other students and teachers, and even by her friends in some instances. But Casey's default reaction would always be to tell a lie on top of the previous lie, and occasionally her older brother Lee would even defend her. Despite her performing well academically, she eventually stopped turning up to school altogether, informing the school of many different uh, family emergencies and difficult situations that meant she couldn't actually attend. Um, Whilst at the same time, as her parents were uh, becoming concerned of what she was doing and kind of growing suspicious of it, she would also spin different stories and different lies each time that they confronted her. 
Instead of going to school, she would actually spend her school hours at her older boyfriend's houses,、um, and she would actually later take up a part-time role as a waitress at a local hard rock cafe、uh, instead of going to lessons. Dave Grohl memorabilia there, maybe? They've got to be in it. Got to be some foos. Go on, Dan. Number nine. What if I say I'm not just the other? What if I say I'm not just another one? Yep, like it. So yeah, a really bizarre note to make here about Casey no longer attending high school is that she did not inform her parents of the impact that this was actually having. In fact, she convinced her parents that she had graduated with honors. So much so that they attended Casey's graduation ceremony alongside her grandparents, only to be informed by the school that Casey was actually several credits short of being able to graduate. So there's a bit more to it here. Casey's parents were aware. Um, because the school had contacted them privately in in the weeks to the build up to graduation, Casey had already by this point received graduation gifts.、Um, they threw a big elaborate graduation party for her the day afterwards, despite knowing she hadn't graduated. She got bought a nice gown and cap.、Um, but yeah, the parents were fully aware that she hadn't been attending school、um, in order to graduate, and the parents actually enabled and continued to lie on behalf of Casey. Um, after confronting her about it, she tried to spin it as though the, it was the school's fault. They weren't scheduling her lessons correctly, and they kept cancelling the lessons. But it's all very, very strange. The grandparents were never actually told the real truth, and they were left perplexed when Casey didn't go up on the stage to collect her diploma.、Um, and Casey's parents told her grandparents that there was an admin error. Yeah, so her parents also that they got her the gown and actually got. Booked her a photo shoot to get her the pictures of her wearing her graduation outfits and stuff, so the family members could have also have it as well. But yeah, I think it was the mum more so pushing it, her, being like, "Let's just, you know, let's just tell everyone you graduated. It'll be a lot easier. It'll be less question asked." If the school, you know, the school made an error, she, I think leading to it as well. The school made an error. We'll do this and lead into it. Be fine. But yeah, it is mad. As you'll see, as again a theme in this case, there's no repercussions for her lies. There's no impact. She just we'll, we'll smooth it over with another lie. Lie stacking. Despite her academic setbacks and never re-enrolling at or graduating from high school, Casey maintained a social life and developed a reputation for her party and lifestyle. She was known for always having a boyfriend, going from one relationship straight onto the next. Very rarely being alone, she worked various additional jobs, but her employment history, like her father's, was marked by instability and short-term positions. She later took up a role selling photos for the Incredible Hulk ride at Universal Studios, which I've, I've actually been on that ride. And I was thinking, timing wise, I wouldn't be surprised if it was the time she was working there. Wow.、Um, it depends, obviously, the days and when she was booked. But yeah, it was. It was one of the better rides. It was one of the kind of more legit roller coasters at the time there, because they always had the Aerosmith one. But Hulk was kind of more like outside and a bit more crazy. I don't want to close my eyes. Her relationship with her mother, meanwhile, also began to deteriorate. With one family friend noting, "They were always at each other. They were always at each other's fucking hell. They were always at each other." You talking Sims? <laughs> <laughs> They were always at each other's throats about something. Cindy would tell Casey that she was immature, and Casey would tell Cindy that she was ruining her life. They wouldn't communicate whatsoever if it wasn't for their fighting and bickering. In 2005, at the age of 19, Casey became pregnant. However, the identity of the father has never been publicly disclosed, and still has not been revealed to date. She did deny some allegations, which I'm sure we'll get to. But yeah, she had a fairly long-term boyfriend called Jesse Grund, whom she worked with at Universal.、Uh, the pair got engaged after Casey told Jesse that th- that he was the baby's father. Meanwhile, she did not share the news of her pregnancy with her parents, maintaining that she was a virgin instead, opting to wear slightly more baggy clothes. With her mother Cindy, who worked as a nurse, assuming that Casey had put on weight or been bloated, she somehow managed to keep it a secret from them, despite occasionally living between the houses and Jesse's until two weeks before she was due. Obviously, some people can show quite, you know, it can be the bumps can be smaller and whatnot, but yeah, as a nurse, you would have thought she'd see other signs. And yeah, her family was quite religious as well, so that's one of the reasons she didn't, you know, believe in didn't believe in sex before marriage. So that's another reason why she didn't want to tell her parents. And with all the bickering that she already was having with her mum, I think it probably would be just to avoid any confrontation as well. Yeah, that's the thing with this family. It seems to be instead of talking about things and working through things, it's just oh no. Con-. And I understand. I don't like conflict at all. But they're kind of anytime there's a difficult conversation to be had, it's kind of ah nah, you're right. 
A beautiful baby girl, Kaylee Marie Anthony, was born on the 9th of August 2005. At this point, Jesse did the maths and realised that Kaylee's conception would have had to have taken place before the pair started their relationship. A subsequent DNA test would reveal that Jesse was not the biological father and he was understandably devastated by this. Despite this, Jesse maintained a real close relationship with the newborn, treating her as if she was his own child, with Casey being happy to have any support she could get. Casey also suggested that she believed an unnamed male whom she dated was Kaylee's true father, but that he had unfortunately died in a car crash. Jesse would go on to say the following. When I first met her, she carried herself not like a 19-year-old. She was very energetic. She had a sarcastic sense of humour. She was very smart. She was very fun to be around. She was just the type of person that everybody was attracted to. At the very end, she started to lie about things. I was one of the ones she stole money from. She stole $250 from me and then made up an excuse why she couldn't pay me back or made up excuses why she couldn't be places with me. I found out she was actually seeing someone else at the end of our relationship. She started to pull away and it started to become about her. She started to party and drink. So yeah, that bit that Jesse mentions about her stealing $250 from him, she would also be accused of stealing a checkbook from one of her close friends and spending thousands of dollars on uh, on shopping. And yeah, there were a lot of accusations around her financial behaviour and her morals there. Um, and it would yeah start to spiral, as will the rest of her behaviours throughout this point onwards. Kaylee's birth marked a significant turning point in Casey's life as she transitioned into motherhood and assumed the responsibilities of caring for her daughter. Despite initially being over the moon with Kaylee's arrival, she quickly became bored, with reports suggesting that Casey continued to prioritise her social life and maintaining a carefree lifestyle, often leaving Kaylee in the care of her parents and close friends whilst she pursued her own interests. To combat that, because we we don't want to be... I understand the passion surrounding this case, but to combat that, there were lots of people, including Jessie, that said she was a great mum, she doted on her, um, you know, she, she, she loved Kaylee to bits... At the same time, there are lots of critics and you'll you'll absolutely see why as we go into this a bit more. Um, but yeah, just to put that out there, there are people that said for a brief period of time she was a good mum. Until the last stages of it, as we will get into in terms of, of Kaylee's life, I think she was people did see her, perceive her as a good mum. And I think the party inside of a lifestyle depends on which obviously which what who you listen to, but that's been quite exaggerated. And a lot of people said even the party she was at, she wasn't always drinking. With one of her boyfriends it was she, she was there as a promoter so she wasn't drinking she said you won't see a single drink in my hand in any picture some of her friends said that the way she was with her daughter was exactly how they would like to be with their kids and um, when this news came out they thought if they were to put anyone they knew in this situation she would be the last person that they would put in this situation yeah i think obviously there's a lot of pictures of her partying but i think as well a lot of that was from a long time ago and stuff like that and it's been used as this is evidence against her to, to betray her as a, a party party girl yeah, no, I think that's I think that's fair. And there's a po- a point that we'll talk about shortly where you've just said she never, you know, find a photo of a drink in her hand. I have found photos of her with a drink in her hand, but from this particular night, which is really poignant in this case, I was purposefully trying to find one of a drink in her hand and I couldn't um, for this contest that she entered. Um, and it kind of lines up that she was just working. But everything that people viewed her as in terms of her being a good mother at this point would start to unravel by her behaviours in the timeline um, and her behaviours afterwards, which are really bizarre. So yes, she would regularly uh, leave Kaylee with her parents, but also Kaylee would stay with friends in other apartments around Orlando. With this time frame as well, Casey also called off the engagement with Jesse, although I think it was kind um, kind of a mutual split. And Casey started dating a club promoter called Tony Lazaro. Uh, occasionally working as a shot girl at his nightclub. She left her role at Universal at least a year and a half prior to this, whilst also lying about this to her family and friends. She would inform those that knew her that she had a job as an event coordinator and needed to leave Kaylee with them in order to go to work. However, each time she had arranged this, she would simply go shopping and hang out with her boyfriend instead. This pattern of behaviour would ultimately result in an incident that would horrify and bewilder America for many years to come. And it is here that we move to the timeline of the case of Casey Anthony. Sunday, June 15th, 2008. Kaylee Anthony, now approaching her third birthday, is videotaped on what would become the final piece of footage documenting her short life. She is enjoying a summer's day swim at her grandparents' house, with George, whom she affectionately referred to as Papa Jojo, filming Cindy and Kaylee in the pool together. The family then enjoy an evening together before putting Kaylee to bed for the night. 
Casey by this point had been living between her parents' house, as well as also occasionally staying with friends and boyfriends. As we mentioned, she had developed a habit of leaving her child in the care of her parents and friends in order to fulfill her social life. Casey would claim that during this evening, her and her mother Cindy got into a huge argument wherein Cindy ultimately called into question Casey's suitability as a mother. June 16th, the following morning, Cindy got up and went to work between 7 and 8 a.m. Casey later left her parents' house with Kaylee at around 12.50 p.m. At this point, George waved goodbye to the pair, gave a kiss to his granddaughter, and depending on who you believe in this case, this would officially mark the last time that Kaylee was reportedly seen in public. She was wearing a pink shirt, jean shorts, sunglasses, and carrying a backpack. Casey informed her parents that she was taking Kaylee to stay with her nanny, whom Casey identified as Zaneda Zani Fernandez Gonzalez. Um, so there'll be a lot more on Zani the nanny shortly. This was not too out of the ordinary for George and Cindy as they had regularly heard their granddaughter say the word Zani. Harrowingly, on the same day, someone within the Anthony family home did an internet search on the family computer for the following terms. Shot girl costumes, suffocation and foolproof suffocation. In a later trial, it would also be alleged that, on the same computer, the following searches were made. Chloroform, chest trauma, neck breaking, how to make chloroform, and internal bleeding, as well as the particularly disturbing, how to make weapons out of household items. There'll be a lot more about this search history as we go into the later trial. Later the same day, at approximately 7.45pm, Casey is recorded by the surveillance cameras of a blockbuster video store in East Orange County. She is seen laughing, joking and arm in arm with a male believed to have been Tony Lazaro. The pair then go on to rent two movies, Untraceable and Jumper. Kaylee is nowhere to be seen and this is believed to have been the day that her life was ended. The following morning on June 17th, Casey informed her mother that she was heading to Tampa for a work trip. Um, Orlando to Tampa is roughly an hour and 30 minute drive each way. Casey then uses the family car, which is in her father's name, in order to make her quote unquote commute. Before Cindy could even begin to start asking questions, Casey informs her that Kaylee is with her nanny, Zenaida, before ending the call. And yeah, I think at this point, Casey is still very angry about the argument and the names that were her mother calling her basically an unfit mother um was there was still a lot of friction between the pair so yeah this is how that day particularly ends and it's there's concern already amongst the family june 18th casey returns to her parents neighborhood unannounced but she is not there to visit her parents instead casey knocks on the door of a neighbor brian burner's house and asks to borrow a shovel in order to dig up a bamboo root Brian would later claim that Casey returned the shovel to him within an hour. And bamboo roots, but I've got bamboo in my garden. They, they spread, don't they? They do, and they're very sharp when you start taking them out. Mm. That does a cut my, hand, my hands on those things. <laughs> so be careful, uh, you bamboo fans. Um, <laughs> such a nervous um. Over the next four weeks, a bizarre series of events occurs during which Casey tries her best to minimise any contact with her parents and nobody recalls seeing Kaylee, Anthony, alive. On June 20th, four days after Kaylee was last seen in public, Casey was photographed taking part in a hot body contest at Fusion Nightclub in Orlando, which is where her boyfriend Tony worked. It's a hot body contest. Yeah. It's lots of layers, isn't it, Ben? Like, and just eating chilies. Yeah, it's who can, yeah, who can... Uh reach the highest temperature of course i also one i got really thrown by this part not that i've stayed on it for very long but oh, so no God. one newspaper called it a hard body contest and i was like well which one is it but this was the one as i said when tom mentioned that she says look look at the photos i didn't have any drinks yet you know there were no photos of her on this night holding any drinks and she claimed she was there working and that the hot body contest needed an extra number if you do believe she's guilty and put this into the context that her daughter's been missing for four days it's very strange. Definitely, yeah. Despite numerous photos showing Casey dancing and having fun with her friends, Casey claims to be there for work purposes, like Ben said, not to have fun. Though she obviously, she is, she's not, I guess she's not going to be standing there looking miserable if they're taking photos of her in the instance of trying to be at work doing a hot body contest. But in the context of Kaylee missing and whatnot, it is very, very bizarre. Three days later, Casey and Tony break into the garden shed of her parents' home in order to retrieve a petrol can to fuel her car. She had very little money at this point, and so felt that this was the only way she could refuel her vehicle. When George later confronted his daughter in person about this whilst demanding to see Kaylee, she stormed away from him and told him that Kaylee was with her nanny. 
During this time, cell phone records show that Casey was in the area surrounding the parents' home on numerous occasions at different times in the day and night. So just to point out, this is very much George and Cindy's kind of account of what's happened. Casey's account of things later on that she reveal, uh, George wouldn't be asking those kind of questions. On June 28th, Casey's car was towed from the car park of a Czech cashing company after one of the supervisors worked there reported it to have been abandoned for a few days. The vehicle was found to have no petrol in it, and over the following days, Casey is caught on surveillance at numerous shopping outlets including Target, Winn-Dixie, JC Penny, and Blockbuster Video. In early July, Casey made the decision, this one I really can't quite understand, uh, decided to get the tattoo on the back of her shoulder. She got the words Bella Vita, which is Italian for beautiful life, surrounded by three sparkles. At around this time, she made the following diary entry. I completely trust my own judgment, and I knew that I made the right decision. This was the happiest that I've been in a very long time. I hope that my happiness will continue to grow. This month is very, very strange, depending on what you believe the context of this case to be. If she has murdered her child or her child has died in her care and then is behaving like this and doing these different things, it is gruesome behaviour, really, really evil behaviour. However, if her daughter genuinely is, to play devil's advocate, in the care of a nanny... This is normal life. But the fact that no one had observed Kaylee in public during this period either kind of lends itself to the the, the former being more likely. And it's worth noting at this point, um, Casey's story of how things played out is completely different. Casey's basically implied that her dad is is involved within this and maybe maybe an accidental death, but told her just to, you know, act normal, act as if everything's fine, act normal and that she's just following her dad's instructions to live normal. And also some experts have said that for a young person grieving, a lot of times people do is they just act normally. They suppress it. They just live a normal life. They would actively do some things like going out and stuff like that to try and distract themselves. And they just, they can do that. And in some ways, the more, because they're trying to tell themselves it hasn't happened. They're trying to distract themselves and they just can't process the fact that this thing has actually happened to them. And the, and the expert said on the lines of, this actually shows that she, the reasons why she's a good mother, which I know that all, a lot of people will be like, her party in after this doesn't mean she's a good mother. But this expert says, this actually shows the fact that she's a good mother because she's she obviously cares about the child so much and she's grieving in this way, which means this. But I completely understand why people would then take that, that very hard to take that as a, as a reason. Yeah, there is, I think I saw on Reddit, there is also some... There, well, there are there are um, Casey Anthony supporters out there, and there are some people that state actually this Bella Vita, beautiful life was actually a, a tribute uh, to her daughter. Yeah, I mean, she, accidentally, but yeah, she now has a tattoo that covers it. That kind of shits on it, yeah. Yeah, so that, yeah, yeah. So we then move to July fifteenth, which is twenty nine days since Kaylee was last publicly seen. Again, depending on who you believe. After receiving a call to say that their car had been impounded, George and Cindy Anthony pick up Casey's car from a tow yard. George, in then a uh, throwback to his days as a police officer, observes a strong death like odor emanating from the rear of the vehicle. Later, back at the Anthony family home, after numerous confrontations and having not seen Casey for a month, Casey arrives out of the blue, where she informs her mother and her brother Lee that she hasn't seen Kaylee in 31 days and that a babysitter named Zaneda Fernandez Gonzalez, or or Zanny, had kidnapped her. This is why I feel that this, we'll we'll talk about it more because we're going to play the 911 call, but this is why I feel more... I lean more towards the parents not having anything to do with this, but we'll, we can we can talk about that. So Cindy Anthony then immediately calls 911 to report Kaylee missing, ultimately contacting them on three separate times during this day, where the following bizarre exchange takes place during the third call. 911, what's your emergency? <laughs> I called a little bit ago. The deputy says I found out my granddaughter has been taken. She has been missing for a month. <laughs> We're talking about a three-year-old little girl. My daughter finally admitted that the baby's in the store. I need to find her. Your daughter admitted that your ba- the baby is where? The babysitter took her a month ago. My daughter's been looking for I told you my daughter was missing for a month. I just found her today, but I can't find my granddaughter. And she just admitted to me that she's been trying to find her herself. There's something wrong. I found my daughter's car today, and it smells like there's been a dead body in the damn car. Okay, what is the three-year-old's name? Kaylee. C-A-Y-L-E-E. Anthony. 
Haley Anthony? Yes. How long has she been missing for? I have not seen her since the 7th of June. Is your daughter there? Yes. Can I speak with her? Okay, it's very They want to talk to you. Answer the question. Hello? Hello? Yes. Can you tell me what's going on a little bit? I'm sorry? Can you tell me a little bit what's going on? My daughter's been missing for the last 31 days. And you know who has her? I know who has her. I've tried to contact her. I actually received a phone call today now from a number that is no longer in service. I did get to speak to my daughter for about a moment, about a minute. Who has her? Do you have a name? Her name is Zenaida Fernandez Gonzalez. That was audio taken from the third call um, that Cindy had made to police that day. Um, the first two were quite interesting because they were slightly different, uh, both in the matter of the call and the tone and behaviours in the call. So the first call that day was, number one, she wanted to report Casey to the police for stealing the family's car and also stealing money from the family. And she starts the call by saying, there's an individual I want you to arrest. She doesn't go on to say it's her daughter until quite deep into the call, which is interesting. It's very bizarre. You can tell the, her tonation and her, her worry definitely evolves in this. I, I think you're right, Then I think this does indicate to me that Cindy isn't involved in this whatsoever. And she thinks that, yeah, this sounds, it's very much sounds like a mum saying, I'm going to tell, you know, your teacher or like, or, you know, it's essentially going, I'm going to have to do the report you because you go, I can't deal with you sitting in the car and acting this way anymore. It, it, and the, and Kay, Kaylee's kind of an afterthought in that. It's not even, a, it's yes, not yeah. just kind of a, she'll be somewhere. Yeah. You know, she'll be at someone's house, whatever. I haven't seen her in 31 days or whatever, but yeah, that doesn't seem to be a big thing. But then, the call number two mm-hmm. is when that's when Casey's made it clear to Cindy that oh well I haven't seen her in 31 days as well because she's been taken and that's when she's really panicking so yeah so call call number two it, from Cindy to the police is to say that she had now found Casey and Casey had shown up to the house and in this call she's requesting her daughter who again she doesn't name as her daughter she says this individual needs to be arrested and then eventually reveals it's her daughter um, but she's basically calling to request her daughter to be arrested as the result of a missing child but again the tone is slightly it's, it, it, as Tom said it, it becomes worse and worse and more frantic as each call goes on between call number two and call number three that's when I believe Casey has introduced the idea of a kidnap and, and Zaneda uh, Fernandez Gonzalez into the into the story I think one of the most shocking things is is how Casey is so meh on the phone yeah. and uh, she sounds like you know your parents say like say happy birthday to your nan oh, fuck. but um, it's, it's very like she, she doesn't know why she's on the phone it's yeah. just a hassle to her but in this is like these phone calls George isn't really involved I am playing devil's advocate massively throughout this and I will do throughout the whole covering the case I'm not saying this is what I believe I'm just saying if you play devil's advocate in terms of what's been said otherwise essentially Casey's saying that she's been told to act normally and not panic and it will be fine or be sorted out mm-hmm. um, and even led to believe that you know you'll be reunited with with Kaylee is what George said as well apparently wasn't to her so she's just seeing this as all part of like she's very like shrug worthy about it all but to to counter that the car was full of rubbish as well when they collected the car which they believed that that was the, done to try and hide the odour George was able to pick up on the smell but also Cindy being a nurse she was familiar with the smell of dead bodies as well so I think if you are going down the route of George being involved Cindy was more than capable of smelling that as well yeah and then she, I mean she would later try and sort of retract that phrase slightly instead of I mean she was very clear in saying it smells like there's been a dead body in there she would try and uh, make that be actually no it was like a turn of phrase I was just saying it smells like stinky in there you know it's not a commonly used phrase is it like if someone stinks I smell like there's a dead body in there. is it Dan? no I think you're right it's not that common no it smells like yeah there's a bad one from my childhood that my mum used to say go on it's embarrassing but I've said worse that smells like something that's crawled up your ass and died oh yeah 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 okay it's everyone then good no not everyone no yeah we all agreed quickly (laughs) the one thing that i picked up straight away is it is very um abstract but is when she when casey's first you can hear her saying i don't want to talk to them i don't want to you know don't be when she first says hello i would put a lot of money on her going saying hello with her eyes rolling like 
hello yeah that's fair i mean there's even there's some bits you can pick up in the, in the conversation when the police are patching the through to the next part their mum and mum and casey still carrying the conversation and yeah these calls were all good and infamy in in terms of what's been said and what people can kind of take from them and yeah it, it it's very easy to paint one clear picture from this and that casey has no remorse for what an action that she's done so if you hadn't guessed everything that casey said during that call was later proven to have been a lie her entire demeanor in comparison to her very frantic and emotional mother was incredibly cold and matter of fact. She did not seem to be at all concerned about the gravity of the situation or even the fact that her daughter was and had been quote unquote missing for 31 days. The following day, law enforcement began searching for Kaylee whilst also interviewing each family member at length and a huge number of lies continued to fall from the mouth of Casey Anthony, which ends up sending investigators on somewhat of a wild goose chase. And we'll play a little bit of this clip for you now. I know in my gut there's the feeling as a parent, you know certain things about your child, you can feel that connection. And I still have that feeling, that presence. I know that she's alive. Whether you have a bucket load of evidence downstairs that contradicts that and says otherwise, or all you have is speculation, well, or, or nothing at all. I mean, whatever it is, if there's still that chance with all of these tips that have come through, I know that... It's been I know that a lot have been discredited, but we ran them down. And is every and we had more than speculation. Is every tip and, and that's every lead that followed up directly? Yeah. That we have more than speculation. We have a lot, or else we wouldn't be to this point. Mm -hmm. A lot. So yeah, there is footage of numerous different interrogations available in, in uh, full length online. I mean, there are even some videos of body language experts kind of analysing Casey's behaviour there. Um, on one of them, I saw a very popular comment that said, I've panicked more after losing the TV remote than Casey did with her daughter. Yeah, so the uh, context there with the Wild Goose Chase, Casey hadn't been working at a Universal for some time, but she brought the, brought the police to the Universal and the detectives there. Um, little did she know the police had already visited there to check her story and have found out she hadn't worked there for some time. So the police then bring Casey along there to kind of be like, try and trip her up and basically shock her into knowing that we know a lot more than you think we know. But Casey, uh, she, you know, straight face talking to people trying to, and eventually got let through because they've let her through. And then she's walking through the offices of Universal and apparently she was waving at people. And they were doing that thing. Obviously, it's Universal, it's Disney related, and in America, everyone is smiling and happy. It was like waving it, and people were waving her, but with the kind of face of, I'm not too sure who you are, but maybe I should know, and waving back at her. In the UK, that I don't know how people would react to that. No. Certainly not as friendly. No, no. And they and eventually, it's found out that, you know, um, she hadn't been working there. So Casey tells investigators several elaborate lies about who Zaneda is, including lots of irrelevant details about her own background and family dynamic. She says she was introduced to Zaneda by her Universal co-worker and good friend, Jeffrey Hopkins, because Jeffrey had been hiring her for many years as a babysitter for his son, Zach. What are these? Four massive lies from Casey would quickly be unpicked here. Number one, Jeff said under oath that they were acquaintances and had never been friends. Number two, Jeff had not worked at Universal for six years. Number three, Jeff had never heard of Zaneda Fernandez Gonzalez. And number four, Jeff did not have a son called Zach. And in fact, he did not have any children at all. So Casey also entirely made up the name and backstory of another co-worker, Juliet Lewis, who it was later proven did not exist. She's given a real name here for Jeff, who did actually work together, but the pair barely knew one another. Um, and he's called to the stand and it's so funny to watch him be asked all these questions that he's just like, no, don't have any kids. Don't know as Aneda Fernandez Gonzalez. So yeah, all of this is already not looking very good for Casey whatsoever. Over the following two days, Casey, as Tom said, takes detectives to numerous locations uh, that were relevant to the search of her daughter, or, or that claim to be relevant for the search of her daughter, including Universal Studios, where she said she was working as an event coordinator, and also to an apartment in downtown Orlando, um, which again, she said uh, she used to drop off Kaylee there, and this was where Zaneda was living. The apartment, which was revealed to be vacant, had not been rented for several months. And then after leading three senior detectives around Universal Studios for, for more than an hour, supposedly en route to her office, she eventually reaches a dead-end corridor, turns around and coyly admits with her hands in her back pockets and, and letting out a bit of a giggle, um, I don't actually work here. 
Her former supervisors at Universal revealed to police, and they'd already been in discussions with police prior to the visit, that Casey had actually not worked there for two years. And when she did work there, she was not an event coordinator. She sold photos for the Incredible Hulk ride. The, the, the thing to note here as well is the fact that Casey also was lying to her parents for two years that she wasn't. She was still working at Universal, and she was leaving the house every day. And yeah, she kept that up, and the parents still thought she worked there. So that's again two years of deceit. Um, she, people, that's why she was stealing money or family members and whatnot because she didn't actually have any money. Steal, stealing petrol from a, a, a canister in a shed, like a fucking what's that zombie series? Walking Dead. Yeah, sort of. walking skint. Yeah. Um, but I don't want to walk. I want to be driving. So that's why I'm getting the fuel. Uh, yeah, lying for that long, um, which I imagine that would create for me the anxiety of trying to keep that lie up mm-hmm. for that long. And then yeah, she's basically it's just kind of scrounging around and staying with with her boyfriend, working some club nights and stuff like that. But that that's the the thing though. She's the amount of anxiety and stress that would cause any of us. She's so calm and matter of fact about it, and it comes naturally to her as well, which is the the kind of the element of the fact that she would have would have been diagnosed as a pathological liar it's almost as if even when she's caught on the spot she can immediately spin another yarn casey was immediately arrested under the charges of child neglect obstruction of a criminal investigation and given false statements to law enforcement when asked why she had told so many lies she tried to cover this by telling even more lies before eventually saying she was trying to solve the whole thing by herself and that she was scared she claimed that she had taken officers to these locations because she was familiar with them, and so her two and a half year old daughter would have been familiar with them too. Which, yeah, they, I think it was very. I think one of the police maybe really joked about saying, "Well, she's not old enough to get a cab here. Why would she come to the place where you used to work? Because you've been there with her before." Casey remained in Orange County Jail for the following month, whilst the rest of the state searched for Kaylee to no avail. Shockingly, Casey was briefly bailed from jail by Tony Padilla the nephew of a California bail bondsman who believed this was the best chance to find Kaylee, that he revoked his half a million dollar bailout after an angry crowd gathered outside the Anthony family home and he claimed to have seen the real Casey Anthony. Tony described her as narcissistic and promiscuous as she returned to jail with the entire country rapidly turning against her. On August 11th, 12th and 13th, a meter reader by the name of Roy Cronk, who was working in a location not too far away from the Anthony family home, pulled over in his vehicle before going to the side of the road to urinate. Suddenly, he noticed an unusual white and grey object sitting in the wooded entrance of a swamp area. He makes three separate calls to police in each of the next two days, all of which are available online. After the first call, he is advised to call a specific tip line regarding the case. Then, after the second call, he is met by two police officers who search the area but do not find anything they believe to be suspicious. He then calls them for a third time to say that he believes he can see a human skull and police once again quickly search the area but do not find anything suspicious. Uh, and yeah, here is the audio from the first call. 911, what's your emergency? Hi, I don't have it. I always, I don't always, I call the non-emergency line. How can I, I help you, sir? Uh, I'm a meter reader with Orange County, and I had the route today that included the Anthony's home. Mm-hmm. Okay, and I went down to the school and came back. And when I was coming back, I stopped between the two swamp areas there. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about or not. No, but go ahead. But there's a stretch of road there that goes from like the, where they started their road is down to a school, and and in between it on either side there's a swamp. And if you're heading back out towards the main road uh, on the uh, left-hand side in an area, I noticed something that looked white, and there was, I don't know what it is. I'm not telling you it's, you know, it's Kaylee or anything of that okay. nature. But that, I just thought, huh? Do you know what street Anthony home is on? Yeah, it's on Good Hope, isn't it? I've heard this before. A lot of people send, tend to uh, go and relieve themselves and find the body, didn't they? That's happened like three or four times in our cases. The one it made me think of straight away was the Adnan Syed case, uh, the serial one. Um, but it has happened in a few cases. Well, that was the the first call from Roy Cronk. The other ones are available online, and he would actually uh, go on to make a, a final call uh, later in our timeline. Looking at the comments of these, I mean, he'd also appear in the trial as well, sorry, so he'd also um, uh, be interviewed at the stand. But looking at the comments of these 911 calls, people, many people at least, seem to view Roy as controversial and kind of a dubious character in this case, with a few people stating that he gives off weird vibes quote weird vibes um, and also their beliefs that he may have been placed or guided to that location by someone to specifically make these calls i don't know how much i buy into that because Same. it's just guided i mean whose benefit is like if casey did it 
why does she want the body to be found? Mm-hmm. If George is involved in it again as well, why would he want the body to be found? George is on the street wearing t-shirts, raising money for the, the fund, you know. So I, I don't really think that makes sense to me in any way, shape or form. So, yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. So just to reiterate, this is August, uh, the sort of mid-August. It's kind of height of summer, very, very hot and humid, um, and no action based on these calls is taken. Nothing is discovered. Um, and it's this is this location is literally within half a mile of the Anthony family home as well. So we'll, uh, we'll be back to that location shortly. The only thing I will say is, in Florida especially, those kind of swampy areas, I'm not going there for a piss. Because they're fucking terrifying, and they've got weird little creatures in there as well. I'm not going in there. Where are you pissing? Probably at Denny's, Shoney's. Have you heard about those little fish? That, it's not in America, but they can swim up your pee and get lodged in your... They do like little bards come out, don't oh. they? Yeah, I've heard about those guys. Tough wank. Mm. Mm. Definitely. Okay. October 14th, 2008. Casey Anthony is indicted on charges of first-degree murder along with aggravated manslaughter, aggravated child abuse, and four counts of lying to police. She continues to have heated arguments with her family members via video calls from jail, which I find bizarre, and her thinking that's not going to come up or be used against her, where she labels them as media-seeking and heartless. To this point, she generally seems uninterested in the huge amount of publicity the case is getting, as well as the search for her missing daughter. Berating her parents for believing Casey might have information regarding Kelly's whereabouts, Casey pleads not guilty to all charges. There's one particular point where she's saying, like, I saw your nice little cameo on the news, which is so bitchy. And it's like, that's why I think Cindy's mum is doing the right thing. I do kind of think Cindy's mum is quite liking being in the centre of it as well. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, it's very uh, odd how she's talking to her mum about it. And it just seems to be very bitchy and passive-aggressive. Yeah, and that the, the video call... From jail is available as well it's a fascinating watch because the mum keeps asking kc to look her in the eye and so when you please look at me you know i need yeah. to ask you some questions and she's like i need to look at the camera how can i look at you and it just all gets very and the, the dad's wearing a, a, a helpline number for the, the search mm. for kaylee and it all just gets it doesn't feel like a family it no and like, even when her brother talks to her on one of these calls he's very like doesn't seem surprised by what kind of trouble she's got yeah. herself into and he's very like look you just need to kind of help we all, we all know you're acting a bit weird. Um, so yeah, they all seem to be suspecting here. December the 11th, 2008. Roy Cronk calls police for a fourth time, once again leading detectives to the wooded area less than a half a mile away from the Anthony family home. Here, detectives discovered a series of bones as well as what appeared to be a child's skull concealed within a rubbish bag that was sealed with duct tape. <laughs> Why are you so bad? I thought you ducked under the tape. Here, detectives discovered a series of bones as well as what appeared to be a child's skull concealed within a rubbish bag that was sealed with duct tape. Upon further investigation, they found the remains of a heavily decomposed child's body wrapped within a Winnie the Pooh blanket, with hair fragments still attached to the duct tape and some additional tape hanging from the skull. Her body had been dumped just 19 feet from the nearest road. On December 19th, 2008, the following week after additional discoveries are made at the swamp, the devastating news of the discovery of a child's body fills American news outlets. The skeletal remains are confirmed to be that of two and a half year old Kaylee Anthony, six months after her initial disappearance. The death was ruled as a homicide, but the cause of death was not determined due to the significant decomposition of the body. If police had found her during the tip-offs from Roy Crunk in August, this may have been far more possible to analyse and identify. Candlelit vigils were held all across America in remembrance of Kaylee, and a trial is scheduled to take place at the Orange County Courthouse in Orlando. Um, and there were numerous reasons why the trial was delayed, part of which was due to um, jury selection and people without being identified or selected without any kind of existing bias on the case um, and also numerous appeals uh, while the investigation was ongoing. So this this trial wouldn't actually go ahead uh, for another, well, another two and a half years. They actually had to get the jurors to be 100 miles away, didn't they, and drive, basically, and they had to live away from their families for as long as this trial was going to go on. I mean, I've never done jury service and actually would love to, but I know a lot of people who have done it gone, it's the worst thing. It's so boring. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people didn't want to do it. Um and, you know, this is such a well publicized case that it'd be very hard not to find people with any bias before going into it as well. 
completely. So at this point, one would assume that most indications point towards Casey Anthony having some form of involvement in the disappearance and death of her daughter. She had already told investigators, family members and friends more lies than it would be possible to remember. She had not reported her daughter missing until her parents forced her to. She completely invented the identity of her daughter's proposed kidnapper and her vehicle allegedly had the smell of death within it, the boot of which contained hairs that belonged to Kaylee. And yeah, in terms of her telling them more lies than was remember, I was going to literally sit down and watch all the interrogations, all of the um, interactions with her family and literally count the lies but it got beyond 20 and i thought that's getting big numbers that's getting, yeah i can't count them <laughs> so you would assume at this point i mean dan what what are your vibes right now are they strong against uh casey a hundred percent yeah she's built a web of lies she doesn't seem trustworthy she seems a bit strange um yeah it's not right i think it's hard not to be from what we've said so at this point, everything, with the exception of like concrete evidence, everything is po- pointing towards Casey having some kind of involvement in this. According to the prosecution, Casey had complete access to everything. The duct tape, the blankets, the shorts, the shirt, the car, specifically the Winnie the Pooh blanket had been seen in, in Casey's possession. She obviously had access to the child and was the last one seen with her in public, allegedly. Though a motive could be disputed, it is quite fair to allege, based on her previous behaviours, that she was not enjoying life and uh, the responsibilities that came with being a mother, um, and that Kaylee had become a burden to her social life. So the prosecution were essentially saying that Casey murdered Kaylee by suffocation after giving her a Xanax and then disposing of her body, making her best effort to uh, stage it to look like a kidnapping. A, th- a thing to add about the computer as well, which the prosecution were kind of uh, negatively looked at for not using this as a point, was the browser she used was the uh, Firefox and the parents were using just the basic Internet Explorer. So I know that sounds like a really minor detail, but I mean, I'm sure a lot of parents will be the same. They'll just use the one that comes with the computer. <laughs> and it's usually, yeah, it was all searched on Firefox, which was definitely something that she was using rather than them. One other theory that wasn't so much pushed by the prosecution, but is very prominent online, to go back to Zaneda Fernandez-Gonzalez, or uh, Zanny, is that uh, baby Kaylee was actually taught by Casey to use the word Zanny in front of her grandparents. And this is something that she would regularly say in front of Cindy and George. But instead of Kaylee going to see uh, Zanny, the fictional babysitter, in Casey Anthony's world, Kaylee was going to see Zanny in the form of Xanax, uh, a medication that is used to treat panic disorders and anxiety, but it also can have uh, a heavy impact as a sedative or a twank. Twank, <laughs> twank, I, yeah. twank. Crunk gave me some twank <laughs> And it can also have an impact as a sedative or a tranquilizer. Um, it was alleged that Casey would give Kaylee a Xanax before leaving her in an empty apartment in order to go out partying. So that would really be, I'm taking Kaylee to go and see Zanny. And if she would ever say Zanny in front of her grandparents in her world, it would probably mean a, a, a sleep, a long sleep. That makes a lot of sense because, yeah, Zanny is, is the kind of street term for the drug. Mm. And your yeah, parents wouldn't know that. And I guess well, her parents wouldn't assume that she'd been there anyway because obviously it's her daughter. There's other things that are kind of like hidden, like the fact that the empty apartment she took her, took her to, which said that she lived at, basically that was her friend's old apartment. So she knew of the address of her heart. So yeah, so you've got Zanny from the name of Zanix and where the body was actually found, the two houses it was between, the surnames of those families were Fernandez and, Gon- and Gonzalez. Which, it's kind of too perfect that I don't really, I don't know if, if Casey Anthony is, going, is saying Zanny as her own private joke, really. Mm-hmm. And then I dumped the body between these two houses and their name's Fernandez Gonzalez. So Zanny, Zanny's got her. <laughs> Zanny Fernandez Gonzalez. It's too like, perfect. I don't know. I don't know. And, I, and like, that's one of those things, where, you know, you read, you read and read it and all those facts and stuff yeah. like that. And it's like, is it just too perfectly wrapped up in a bow? But Well, yeah, the, I mean, the momentum and everyone's belief uh, of the guilt of Casey Anthony is, is very, very strong at this point, um, in, obviously including the prosecution. And people have even speculated that it could be possible at this point that everything was pointing so perfectly and overwhelmingly towards Casey being guilty that the prosecution may even have felt that the case, that the prosecution may... <laughs> it's a sedative or a twank. Oh, no, he's got it. It's a sedative or a twank. See, he's fucking quick. 
is that the yeah the prosecution may even have felt that the case was almost cut and dry that they could even have potentially though a professional lawyer legal team member taken their foot off the gas or relaxed a bit i don't know if that would happen in that world they put forward the theory without too much concrete evidence or motive that Casey had drugged her daughter before duct taping her mouth and nose and then placing her into the boot of her car where she left her for several days. She then, in an effort to either frame her parents or stage a kidnapping gone wrong, discarded Kaylee's body in an area where she knew it would be found obviously less than half a mile away from the family home. So at this moment, everything really did seem to point towards a guilty verdict for Casey, which carried a possible death penalty at the time, until we introduce Mr. Jose Angel Baez. So this case really put Jose Baez on the map in terms of his abilities and impact as a lawyer, and it would also massively influence his, his, uh, his reputation and his future hires. He was held in very high regard for his skills as a storyteller and his deeply strategic approach to high profile cases. Baez was very good at humanizing his clients, which we definitely do see in this case, and creating compelling courtroom narratives, which were saturated with persuasive advocacy. He consistently was able to relate each case to jurors on a personal level in a digestible manner and could present details to each juror in a resonating and captivating manner. He appeared to be very empathetic, very intelligent, very intricate and also very likeable. And in the future he would go on to represent Aaron Hernandez and even Harvey Weinstein. Which, mm, an interesting list of clients. Mm. So yeah, this, this man's introduction, this man's performance completely changes the the trajectory of this case in late may of 2011 during the opening statements of the trial of casey anthony which was broadcasted live in america for the duration prosecution attorney linda drain burdick outlined the case against casey anthony painting a picture of a party girl who was not too responsible when it came to trying to find her missing daughter but very responsible for the reason that she was missing including her murder the prosecution used internet search history believed to have been conducted by Casey to suggest that she used chloroform, which had been searched 85 times on the family computer, with traces of chloroform later found in the boot of her vehicle. So yeah, it turns out that 85 times was actually a software error, and it was actually there only the one time. Defense attorneys Jose Baez and Cheney Mason, both of whom were representing Casey pro bono, presented the defense's opening statement asserting Casey's innocence and suggesting that Kaylee had drowned accidentally in the family's swimming pool. They consistently made reference to the fact that the prosecution would try to make Casey look like, and I quote, a slut. Almost immediately, the defense suggested that George Anthony had covered up the death so that Anthony wouldn't be charged with child neglect. On top of this, he reveals the bombshell allegation that George Anthony, together with her older brother Lee, had been sexually abusing Casey since she was eight years old. They suggested that this was in fact the root cause of Casey's lying, she was intentionally trying to hide the truth all of her life, because the truth had always hurt her. As well as this, they state that the cadaver dogs picked up two traces of human decomposition, not only in Casey's car, but also in the Anthony family back garden. The prosecution begins presenting itself, calling witnesses to testify about the timeline of events leading up to Kaylee Anthony's disappearance. Witnesses including Cindy Anthony, George Anthony, Casey's friends and law enforcement officers involved in the investigation, former friends, boyfriends, neighbours and roommates of Casey Anthony took the stand, sometimes providing intimate details of the woman standing trial. George Anthony outright denies carrying out any form of abuse towards his daughter, nor any involvement in his granddaughter's death. Cindy Anthony, meanwhile possibly in an effort to get her daughter off a death sentence, takes some responsibility for the Google searches, claiming that part of it was for work-related searches, and others were because the family dog had swallowed some bamboo leaves which contain chlorophyll. So yeah, basically she was saying she searched chlorophyll, it kind of did another thing popped up saying chloroform and she clicked on that to basically read into it. The interesting thing about that is Cindy says, she she says, I did do that, but I didn't do it 85 times. This is before the software mistake was revealed. She says, I did do that, definitely did do that, but I didn't do it 85 times, I did it once. Mm -hmm. And then it came back, there's an error and it was only the one time. So that does kind of line up. And obviously the theory being that you know, Xanax was like, a bigger, too much of the bigger dose was used and perhaps she was suffocated. The chlorophyll kind of feels like a bit of a, I don't know, it doesn't feel overly relevant. Yeah, absolutely. And so to, to also go back to the theory of an accidental drowning, one thing that really did surprise me because I didn't look at photos of this case until right at the end of the research period. And it's actually an above ground swimming pool. Yeah. Um, I had assumed this whole period that it was a, you know, in ground <laughs> swimming pool, like a, you know, a dugout swimming pool below foot level. But 
Did that really surprise me? In there? Yeah, because Casey Anthony says that he, she says no way that it could have been accidental drown, drowning because she couldn't have gotten the pool because the ladder was taken off at the time. Yeah. So yeah. she's adamant about that. Yeah. That was the one thing also that, that kind of threw me was this theory that cadaver dogs had picked up traces in the garden. Though cadaver dogs have, uh, again, playing devil's advocate, there's been times where they've had false readings and so, yeah, yeah it's tricky. So as well as the two leading defence council members being very good at their jobs, they also hired forensic pathologist Dr. Werner Spitz, um, who we saw in our Michael Peterson episode. Um, and he... Yeah. Well, there we go. Uh, and he was called to stand in the fourth week of the trial. Now, Dr. Spitz, who had performed an autopsy on Kaylee, said that his own autopsy simply could not determine whether or not the child's death was a homicide and that his opinion was that the duct tape had been placed post decomposition. Basically, Dr. Spitz uh, asserted that the duct tape, um, he believed, was placed on the body post decomposition, so a long time after the child had died and that if she if it had been placed on Kaylee before or sort of during or even shortly after she had died that there would have been residual DNA on it and there was no evidence that could be found on the duct tape um, in the remains that he then uh, conducted his own autopsy on so yeah that was kind of a that was looked on as kind of a key moment there he also belittled the state's um, autopsy uh, as well um, which didn't go down well with uh, with the prosecution on the 32nd day of the trial, the defence called a lady by the name of Crystal Holloway to the stand. Crystal, who also went by the name River Cruz, made the, again at the time, bombshell admission that she and Casey's father George had been engaging in an affair whilst the search for Kaylee was still ongoing. Crystal made yet another stir amongst the courtroom when she claimed that George had openly admitted to her that his granddaughter Kaylee's death had occurred as the result of a, quote, accident that had snowballed out of control. Now, George, just like Casey's uh, allegations about him, would repeatedly deny uh, these accusations when he later took the stand. When George was questioned about his alleged romance with Holloway, he said that he had met her um, when the pair were working together at the command centre, but he denied having any kind of uh, anything beyond just a, the fact that they were both searching for his granddaughter. During a later cross-examination, Crystal admitted to the prosecution that she had sold her story about an alleged affair for $4,000 to the National Enquirer. So, yeah, that, that hasn't helped Casey's case whatsoever here. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's caused... Obviously, the whole this whole trial was televised. It was the number one story in America at the time. Loads of interest in the case. And this really uh, was a key moment in the trial. I reckon Crystal could have got more money. I agree. I didn't think that was not encouraging it at all but i didn't no, think it no, was no. very very much money and just a reminder if you get the the clue for next week's case four thousand dollars then willing to take it up from meal because according, <laughs> according to him that's chump change uh forensic experts testify about the evidence recovered from casey anthony's car including traces of decomposition kaylee's hair strands and chloroform the prosecution meanwhile presents evidence of casey's internet searches for terms related to chloroform suffocation and neck breaking and they also do a day-to-day -day breakdown of Casey's erratic and highly public behaviours and lifestyle during the search for her missing daughter. The trial lasted for more than six weeks with the prosecution calling 59 witnesses for 70 different testimonies and the defence calling 47 witnesses for 63 different testimonies. Despite this, Casey Anthony did not testify once. Which is always a curious thing, isn't it? Even with Staircase, um, Michael Peterson, they were questioning whether or not to put him on stand. Mm -hmm. You're opening yourself up, especially if they think that the um, person isn't particularly likeable. Well, also her, her track record of getting caught in lies would make yeah. her fodder to any prosecution. She's like assume. a blind spider, Ben. There's lots of webs about. She doesn't know she's going to trip up on one. <laughs> Is that one of mine? <laughs> oh, a fly. But yeah, I actually watched a true crime thing recently. I found it very interesting. The first time I ever heard it was the, um, the defense attorney basically said, you don't have to like my, my client. In fact, you can think he's a horrible human being. And I might think he's a horrible human being too. But you have to know for a fact that he committed this murder. And it's like, that's a real, like, brave <laughs> turn of phrase. But it's true. You can't just say, even if you think she's a complete dickhead, if you think that there's not enough evidence to prove that she's done it, that's yeah. all you can do it on. You can't just go, I think she's a, she likes to drink a lot and she's been acting very weirdly. Yeah, well, this is exactly what Jose Baez did, didn't he? He, he? he was very quick to remove their existing opinions of her. Mm. And he did it in a way that the jury wouldn't have even realised how he... He just made a human. He swapped that the concrete 
evidence for that breakable concrete we have over in the schools in the UK. He Crumbly did indeed. Concrete. Yeah, he did. Prosecution attorney Jeff Ashton delivered the prosecution's closing argument, emphasising Casey's behaviour after Kelly's disappearance and the numerous inconsistencies in her statements to law enforcement. Defence attorney Jose Baez presents the defence closing argument in a far more compelling and engaging manner arguing that Kaylee accidentally drowned and accusing the prosecution of presenting a, and I quote, a fantasy forensic case. And it kind of falls on what I said the other week in terms of if you have one legal team who are very charismatic and very good at telling stories, and then you have one that aren't particularly, no matter what the evidence is, if they can spin it, that's all, it's, that's all the skill that is, is required. Yeah. That's why I still think that there's probably something in putting it through a dull <laughs> dull of system where it's not just a good storyteller it needs to be literally the hard facts rep- represented but yeah the jury deliberates for over 10 hours before reaching a verdict on the 5th of july to the shock of the nation the jury finds casey anthony not guilty of first degree murder aggravated manslaughter of a child and aggravated child abuse casey anthony is found guilty on four counts of providing false information to law enforcement relating to her initial statements about Kaylee's disappearance. Casey Anthony is remanded into custody and awaits sentencing for the four misdemeanor counts. Judge Belvin Perry Jr. If they're a junior, you usually have the same name, so Belvin would be the name. That they're, who the fuck's calling their kid Belvin after a year? Growing up with that name, you go, yep, you're going to have it too. Boy named Sue. Judge Belvin Perry Jr. sentences Casey Anthony to time served for the four misdemeanor counts of providing false information to law enforcement. Casey Anthony is released from jail and leaves the Orange County courthouse with her defence team, disappearing from public view. So, yeah, a big thing here is that she was um, obviously found not guilty and this caused a great deal of shock, anger, dismay, upset across the country. But it was all it all came back to reasonable doubt and any concrete evidence or motive that the prosecution could establish. And they, they just couldn't. And they didn't present it, as, as Tom said, in as compelling way as the defence did. So, it, yeah, it was a huge shock. So another thing that happened here and was confirmed, which upset people even more and threw even more fuel on the fire, is that Anthony was uh, granted double jeopardy, which essentially prevented her from being tried again for the same uh, crime because of the fact that she was given a valid acquittal um, or lack of conviction. So yeah, because she was uh, found not guilty of first degree murder, aggravated manslaughter of a child or any kind of child abuse, she will never face jail time for the charges relating to Kaylee's death. So again, people were very, very upset by this. One thing I also found fascinating was that um, not uh, Jose Baez, but Cheney Mason, the other one of a big character in this case, but the other defense attorney for Casey was very quick and very personal in his public summarization of the verdict. And he was he absolutely slated the prosecution. So we'll play this for you now. Well, I hope uh, that this is a lesson to those of you having indulged in media assassination for three years, bias and prejudice and incompetent talking heads saying what would be and how to be. Uh, I'm I'm disgusted by some of the lawyers that have done this. And uh, I can tell you that my colleagues from coast to coast and border to border have condemned this whole process of lawyers getting on television and talking about cases that they don't know a damn thing about and don't have the experience to back up their words or the law to do it. Now you've learned a lesson. And we appreciate the jury. Those of you that have been objective and professional, we like it. Others, we're going to be talking to again. Thank you very much. That sounds like if you get a a good barbecue, man. (laughs) I was literally thinking that. I know you were. Yeah. Licking your lips. Lots of venom in his words there, despite obviously winning the case. So March of 2017, six years later, Casey Anthony finally breaks her silence in an interview with the Associated Press, stating that she sleeps pretty good at night. When asked about the possibility of her having more children in the future, Casey all but ruled it out when saying the following. Good to be back. Hi. Sorry, right, mate. Oh, Dan. Man, Dan. How's it going, man? <laughs> Thank you. Brilliant. If I'd be dumb enough to bring an... <laughs> If I'd be dumb enough to bring another kid into this world, knowing that there'd be a potential that some little snot-nosed kid would then say something mean to my kid, I don't think I could live with that. After Casey's interview, her parents, George and Cindy, said they were hurt by their daughter's comments and for trying to insinuate that they were responsible for what happened. They go on to kind of say that they haven't had any sleep since this has happened. George wasn't aware at all that they were the defence were going to use any kind of, like, attack on him and, like, implication of him, which, yeah, that was... 
I think that if you believe that he is completely innocent of, of that kind of thing, then obviously that'll be a massive thing. You're sitting there basically trying to see your daughter defend herself and then you're being thrown into the mix when you're completely innocent of what happened. But I know a lot of people do believe George had some kind of weird involvement within this. Basically, Casey's parents released a joint statement together, which read... After years of silence, Casey Anthony has once again pointed to her father as a suspect in the disappearance and death of his granddaughter, Kaylee. George, who has continued to try and move forward from this tragedy and who has vindicated on multiple occasions, is once again forced to relive the hints, rumours, lies and allegations that are being made by Casey Anthony. Yeah, there's there's so much more information to George out there. There are um, he was very scrutinised for comments that he made at uh, Kaylee's funeral, um, basically stating that he missed the smell of her sweat. Yeah, there were. There's lots more to George out there, and obviously we've we tried our best to condense this episode where possible. But he was also entangled with accusations that he had tried to end his own life shortly before Casey's trial, leaving a letter for his family and going to a hotel room where numerous empty pill packets were found. After this interview was released from Casey, he said that his heart hurt now more than ever before uh, and that he had lost both a granddaughter as well as a daughter in this whole process. Another interesting point uh, worth noting is that there was actually a real Zenaida Fernandez Gonzalez um, that was found um, and attended Casey's trial. Now she also sued Casey Anthony for uh, defamation, um, claiming that she had lost her home and her job because of Casey's allegations. Although her case was later dismissed, um, yeah, it was a it was a really interesting that a, a real Zenaida Fernandez Gonzalez was found uh, and attended the trial. In May of 2017, a documentary titled Casey Anthony, an American Murder Mystery aired on Investigation Discovery, which reignited a huge amount of public interest in the case. The documentary showed that, despite the verdict, the death of Kaylee Anthony remains one of the most closely watched and controversial cases in recent memory. And it raised questions about the criminal justice system, media sensationalism, the variation between defence and prosecution, as well as the nature of truth and accountability. So that was the trial of the case against Casey Anthony. We're now going to move on to a bit of aftermath. In 2022, after numerous protests and its production, Peacock released the miniseries Casey Anthony, Where the Truth Lies. Which Ben thinks, you think is a really clever name, don't you, Ben? I did, but I'm taking it back. Why? Where the Truth Lies. It's, it's wordplay. I like it. Yeah, nice, man. Because we have to say, like, we, we probably haven't highlighted just how much outcry there was with the the conviction or the lack of the conviction sorry there was protests outside the, the all the um, jury members were getting countless emails and threats and getting absolutely uh, bombarded with like hate and you know public figures were kind of calling out saying how a disgrace it was it was everyone was piling in and saying you know this is wrong it's so obvious what she's done or yeah, it was a lot, a lot of criticism out there and hatred towards Casey Anthony, hence the name America's Most Hated Woman. There has been a huge amount of criticism regarding Anthony's payment and creative control for the production. Online different news articles state that she received varying amounts of payment for varying reasons, some as low as 200000 Low? I mean, that's pretty good. Simply for supplying photos of her daughter and licensing fees, whilst others estimate it to be as high as one and a quarter million dollars for the photos and interviews throughout. The common estimate is that she received $750,000 all in. Alexandra Dean, who directed the miniseries, has hit out at critics and maintained that neither she nor Peacock pay cases Anthony a penny for it. My biggest hope for the series is that it provokes really profound conversations around how people like Casey are portrayed in the media. I hope it makes people think more critically about where they're getting their information. If it's from an outlet that covers a court case from one side and doesn't want to hear from anyone not on their side, then they don't have the full story. As shown in the miniseries, Casey Anthony, now 38, had been living in Florida with Patrick McKenna, and this is a very weird thing. So who was the lead investigator from her trial, but recently got a place of her own? So yeah, she's been living with him for the last 10 years, which is very odd, and working along with him as well. She is, she is currently working as a legal assistant for McKenna, who interestingly also worked in the O.J. Simpson case, and in 2022, Anthony filed paperwork to launch her own private investigation firm listed as Case Research and Consultant Services, LLC. She previously tried to work as a photographer, but had, was harassed online and in person, which made it her focus attention on investigation work. She basically said something along the lines of, I'm going to do what people tried to do to me, but better, which is, again, an interesting tagline. I would encourage people to watch it. I'm going to talk about how people have slated it in a minute, but it does stir the pot. And I know that it's a very, it is a very biased documentary. Obviously, it's a puff piece. 
she's very emotional in it, which she wasn't emotional in the courtroom. She wasn't emotional on those other testimonies. But there's experts within this saying there's a reason for the way she behaved like she did and her reason why she behaves like she does now. It's essentially, if you believe that George was a weird, crooked guy and sexually assaulted her, then that spins the whole case around. But it's her word against his. And the interesting thing that I revealed from that was she had told her boyfriend, Jesse, before any of this happened, that she had been sexually molested by her father before. In letters, he came out and said it in the courtroom that that had happened. She told him that beforehand. This is before any of this happened. So that had already been put out there. Though, obviously, people can lie and people can say things like that for, you know, attention or for whatever reason or trying to hurt their family. But that was an interesting thing for me because I was like, that's a bit odd and the other thing she seems to say and she's her story along the lines is she went to sleep kaylee was by her on the bed kaylee wouldn't leave to go to the toilet by herself or leave the room by herself if she needed the toilet she'd wake her mum up and they'll go together or you know she wouldn't she wouldn't go swimming by herself she knows not to do that and then when she was woken up she's woken up by her dad holding kaylee and kaylee's body was soaking wet then casey's adamant that kaylee didn't drown mm-hmm. so it's very odd. She says certain things in it which you like. It still makes you go, that's bizarre. But then, because you have those experts around her, it legitimizes a lot of things she says. It's a curious one. As I said, I still think there's something definitely not right with Casey's side of things. But it has muddied my thinking a little bit, I have to say. That's fair enough. But many people have since boycotted the three-part miniseries, and it currently holds, as I said, a terrible rating of 1.9 star rating on Google, 3.7 out of 10 on IMDb, and it's 40% fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. Many of the criticism seems to be that the series is not presented or researched in any objective way, and it is biased towards Casey's innocence, which is, yes, I will completely agree it is completely true in that sense. Though it does have some of the detectives who literally say in it, going, why well, you believe in a single word she says, I believe she killed her daughter. So they do have some people in there. Some of the other documentaries have been basically argued to be slightly the other way because they don't ever put the parents under any pressure whatsoever and the parents probably wouldn't say yes to go on those documentaries if they know they were going to be put under any pressure. So any documentary, there's always going to be a little bit of a swing of bias. I mean, we've, we've spoken about making a murder and how biased that can be if you look at it in certain ways. It's very hard to find a documentary that is straight down the middle. So The Guardian even hit out the series, labelling it 22's worst idea. 2022. Yeah, but it's implied. Do you pick up that or? <laughs> nah, sorry. Was it implied? It was implied. Thank you. For those too young to remember, or lucky enough to have forgotten, Casey Anthony was the OJ Simpson of her day. A 20-something Florida woman accused of killing her two-year-old daughter, Kaylee. Americans might be more divided than ever right now, but one thing all can agree on is Peacock devoting three and a half hours to a Casey Anthony confessional was absolutely 2022's worst idea. I don't know if I... Be- uh, I don't think it is. Like, you can watch it with completely, like, and not believe a single word she says and think, why are you giving her any room to speak? But at the same time, it's like, I mean, that could be anything. You need to hear both sides of the story, I think. And if it's shedding light on things that weren't... Like, I didn't... I hadn't heard about the... her telling Jesse about the... um sexual assault yeah until that one and that's true that's based that's based on fact i I don't think it's a bad thing having another side of things out there personally yeah i mean when i went and got those reviews as well google and imdb some of the comments were actually saying it's too biased um the other way which i didn't expect so it Mm. was saying if you if you want to watch something that's going to make you think she's guilty then don't watch this but these yeah these were just some comments on uh google reviews but they were they were going both ways there wasn't seem to be a trend on you know this is just a fluff piece um but yeah yeah obviously the guardian's comment saying it'd be the uh, worst idea of 2022 was probably a little bit uh tongue-in-cheek in 2022 russia invaded ukraine there was the uvalde uh school shooting china went back into lockdown uh with an omicron variant 300 people died in a maripol uh fear to airstrike and 1163 people were killed in an earthquake in afghanistan and it was also the same year that will smith slapped chris rock which was probably not well thought through yeah that one makes sense i think you can't say an earthquake is an idea no no that's true yeah that's true well, maybe mother nature's idea yeah I'm trying to help you out ben cheers i appreciate that for those wondering whether or not casey still speaks with her family once again according to alexandra dean the director of the miniseries casey has a small life casey has a small life with one close friend and a small circle of trusted loved ones 
including her former defence team. She still talks to her mother and brother, but she doesn't talk to them often. And I wouldn't call their relationship close, but they do communicate. Casey does not speak to her father, George, who is accused of sexually abusing her throughout her youth. George, meanwhile, remains adamant that Casey is ultimately responsible for Kaylee's disappearance and death. He said the following. We are done because when this happened, I lost my daughter and my granddaughter. I lost them both. Justice would be to have my daughter behind bars and have her suffer the same way that Kaylee suffered. I think it's a quite poignant moment now, maybe to even play it, but when Casey was arrested um, early on and she spoke to her father, there's a bit of an emotional moment between them where he's saying, I've been a bad father, and she's like, no, you've been the perfect father, which I kind of feel like for both of them is an interesting moment considering obviously what was to go on to occur. Why is George Stanley saying he's been a horrible father? If anything, that goes against what I think Casey's allegation of things and also her thinking he's involved with it. But yeah, the, as I said, to spin it on his head is like, is if you were to, if you're to believe that George did it, was guilty of sexual assault and he was in some way involved in it, Casey's life has been flipped upside down. She's so used to living in a lie and, and listening to what her father said and all this stuff and she just listened to what he did and it got her into this situation of being America's most hated woman and losing her daughter at the same time. I know a lot of people are not going to believe that that way and I'm not saying that I do. I'm just saying that if that's the alternative to what other people believe, essentially. Yeah, for, for me, I think I think she definitely has some involvement for sure. I just can't decide in my mind whether it was murder or an accident. But I think the big flaw is for me is I don't believe that she would have done it because she wants freedom, because she had parents there that always were happy to look after her. She had, she had friends always happy to look after her. If you thought, I'm not, I'm not a fit person to be a mother, I'm not ready... There's options out there, isn't there? Mm -hmm. I don't think that that's enough motive. And I think there's so much of a support system around her that she's not going to commit this crime because of that. That That's not the reason mm -hmm. of the crime. In my head, that wouldn't make any sense. Yeah, I think, well, even the, in the trial, they couldn't find an outright motive or any concrete evidence to ultimately get the beyond reasonable doubt. I, I think she's definitely guilty in some way. I just don't know necessarily if it was an accident or an intended um, outcome. I mean, I will say, because I was looking into the that particular documentary and it looks like it has been absolutely slated online by various people and news outlets and stuff. But then um, if you have a clear, mo like a lot of people saying boycott it rather than watching it. But what I can see from it is it does come across as quite, quite narcissistic rather than trying to put across genuine facts. That's what I mean. There's, that's what I think. There's, there's experts within it that do the heavy lifting on the actual proof of things and reasons mm. behind things, explaining why she did things. I think I will. I'll watch it. I'll watch I think it's it. worth a watch. I think it's to some people might immediately just be like, too far gone with the thoughts of the other side of it, which is completely fine, and not have to take anything away from it. I think it just it kind of, yeah, muddies the water slightly. We've talked about, obviously, the relationship between George and Casey, despite there being some rumours online that George had uh, written his daughter a letter in the hopes that they could reconcile their relationship. George would essentially double down uh, when he later shared his opinions in an interview with the Associated Press on what he truly believed happened to his granddaughter, um, which he said the following. Inside of my heart, I don't believe that Kaylee drowned. I believe there's something else that happened to her. I believe that Casey or someone else that she was with possibly gave too much drugs to Kaylee. She fell asleep and she didn't wake up. Because that's the thing as well. If, if Roy Crunk's first calls were actioned and the, the area was searched thoroughly, they may have been able to get more evidence uh, and DNA from the scene um, and be able to actually conclude the cause of death. But obviously that was not the case. And like Tom said, there wasn't necessarily as much pressure kind of placed back um, in some people's opinions on Cindy and George. On January the 4th of 2024, uh, the first episode of Casey Anthony's Parents, The Lie Detector Test, um, aired in the United States. Uh, and the, yeah, the show's premise is exactly what it says on the tin. Um, comments in the reviews on this also slate the show. So it's received fairly negative views. People state that despite George struggling with some of the questions and becoming very emotional, both parents seem to pass the tests with flying colours, whilst uh, Casey Anthony's supporters are quick to point out that um, they only appeared in this show for money and that George, in his previous jobs, was trained to pass those tests. Cindy also experienced a panic attack whilst filming for the show. Yeah, interesting model. I mean, if, if, as a policeman, you're trained to pass lines of success. You probably know ways to kind of 
you know manipulate them yeah i saw the trailer for it and he see he does break down when he's asked did you have involvement and he just says i'm 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 upset and i'm emotional because it was so close to home in the location that she was found so it's Mm. yeah i can't say that i've watched it but yeah people do speculate that the the distance thing points to it being casey being ill thought out and just being like a you know even the tape used of all tape found was apparently tape that was matching tape found at the anthony house as well so yeah it's it's, it's definitely up there in my kind of if I could find out the actual what happened mm-hmm. it's probably my top five of, of those I would think I'd like to know exactly what happened and who did what I don't think it's as clear cut or clean cut as some people might think it is so that was the case of Casey Anthony and the death of Kaylee Anthony very tragic very upsetting and very very frustrating one uh, for sure which I completely understand as I said at the start I've never really gravitated too much towards this case but I can completely understand the passion and the fascination with it um, from people that follow it and yeah like we said at the start this could have been a multi-part episode with with how much information is out there there's there's so much more out there if you do want to uh research the case uh, or consume more content on the case yeah 100 percent. it's one that i yeah as i said i saw it on jcs jim can't swim and and it was yeah i found it interesting then but never really looked wanted to feel really look into it anymore and since looking into more this time around I found myself from the very beginning being like, oh, she's just boiling my blood listening to it, thinking they're not asking the right questions or they're not really pushing her on these certain points. Why aren't they pushing further? And then going all the way to watching that do- that slated documentary, thinking like, oh, what if that was a true? Then that would mean this. And then, yeah, I went a little spiral in my head with that. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I just wanted to make it clear. I'm in no way saying that Casey Anthony is, is, is innocent. And I think, uh, but I just, think, like I just think that People should present themselves with as much information as they can before they say something. Hear, hear. Fair play. Anyway, but it's that time of the time of week again where we throw to a cryptic is not the word I'd use, but a clue, a little clue mm. about what is next week's case. And I mean, it says here, Ben thinks it's one of the easiest ones yet. And I mean, there's a lot on the line. Like we said, a hot meal, three course hot meal with our little Benny. Mm. So um, be quick to answer this. Yeah, just a disclaimer, um, the $4,000 thing was just a joke. That was oh. just a little joke. Benjamin Carter's cryptic clues. Everyone gather around for some cr- clues that can be quite cryptic, but he's going to b- give them to you anyway. Hope you can figure them out. But the cryptic clue for next week's episode is, whoa, I think Arnie and Danny have had a bit too much to drink. I know what he says it's easy, but at the same time, I think some people won't find that easy. But um, yeah. This is it's, it's a fairly solid one. It doesn't make complete sense. It does. Okay. It doesn't. I think it'll be got within a few it'll hours. It'll be got. Yeah. It'll be got. It doesn't mean it makes sense. Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, um, just a little note. If uh, These are flying off the shelves, everybody. So if you fancy a, a nice new neon mug, new release on the website now, head over to icmop.co.uk. Um, please grab one. They're great. And thank you guys for joining us. And if you can, if you have a spare moment, why not um, give us a little review? Um, you know, subscribe to the channel or, or follow us on where you're listening to us on and share us. Yeah, that is very helpful. If you share us a little story when you're watching us or whatever, or something interesting, maybe the dog's watching it. We always share it on Instagram because we love, we love to see that. So be sure to share us and tag us in things. We absolutely love it. And if you just can't wait until next week's episode, at the time of recording, we have around 150 extra exclusive episodes over on icmap.co.uk. That's an awful lot. That's an awful lot. Um, Last week, we covered the murder of uh, Fusilier Lee Rigby. um, And this week, we have uh, recently covered the Reservoir Dogs murder of Michael Moss. So some very... Very brutal. Very upsetting uh, cases indeed. But yeah, there's loads of extra content. If you just can't wait, why not go and have a little look for yourself? icmap.co.uk. And guys, like we always say, we say this all the time. Keep on doing. What are you doing? Well, unless it's uh, telling sweet little lies. They're not, they're, some of them weren't. I don't think they're sweet, Ben, about no, um, actually murder child no um don't steal petrol from your dad's shed don't um have an argument with your dad and push him through a plate of glass yeah lots of that's a bad one yeah see you, mm. see you later see you, pip see ya <laughs>